unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. Let's worship together.
ride with me. Fast falls the even tide, the darkness deepens. Oh Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comfort sleep, help of the helpless abide with me. Thou on my head, in early youth did smile, and though rebellious and perverse meanwhile, thou hast not left me, though I oft left thee. Close, Lord, abide with me. Let's sing, abide with me. Death, Lord. 
abide with me. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's shadows flee. In life and death, Lord, abide with me.
Do you hear our cry? Lord, a cry for your overflow that you would send the Holy Spirit today. Lord, to the places that we need it most, to the dry places in our hearts and our lives. God, would you send your overflow, your abundance, your spirit, your healing and your redemption. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome your work. We welcome your word. And we open our hearts right now to you. As we pray so often here, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Right here, in this place, just like heaven. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. My name is Corey. I run our youth ministry here at the Vineyard. Um, so I hang out with our middle and high school students. Um, so if you have a youth, I'd love to connect with you, get to know you. Um, well, whether you're joining us online or you're in here in the room with me, I'm so glad that you guys are here with us this morning. Um, we love that we get to worship with you guys every week. Um, if you are new here, we would love to connect with you and get to know you. So there's a few ways you could do that. Um, you could go to votrweekly.org. You're going to hear me say that a lot because we want you to go there and do all the things that it has to offer. So you're going to go to votrweekly.org, and there's a tab that says Next Steps, and there's a little form under there you can fill out and introduce yourself. We can get to know you, um, and we'd follow up with um, to start a conversation with you guys. You can also grab a Next Steps card at the seat back pocket in front of you. You can fill that out, good old paper and pen, put it in the offering box in the back there, um, and we'll follow up and connect with you that way. <clears throat> um, well, here at the Vineyard, we're all about joining God's mission, transforming all things. You maybe saw that in the lobby on the big wall out there. Um, and we believe that starts in our gatherings here on Sunday mornings. So we, our prayer every week is that you would experience the Lord in this space and that you would be transformed um, from what you experience here. So the one thing I want to highlight to you guys this week is White Out. So White Out is a youth conference for our high school students that happens every year. It's amazing. Some of the youth in here have been there. I've been like a million times as a youth. And then as an adult, I've gone as a leader. I've led worship, done all kinds of things there. Um, but it's amazing. Some of the most impactful moments I've had with the Lord have happened at White Out. Um, it's just a really cool space um, filled with worship and prayer and quality sermons. There's really high quality leaders at this camp. And it's just, it's a really good time. And it's happening in about three weeks. So if you have a high school student and they're not registered, um, again, go to votrweekly.org and there's a registration there. Chat with me. Um, I can help you sign up, all the things. But we're going in a few weeks. So you want to make sure you get your student signed up. It's amazing. <clears throat> so registration for that is at votrweekly.org. And while you're there, you'll see a whole bunch of other announcements. There's always tons of stuff going on at the Vineyard. So um, you can scroll through the other stuff going on, sign up. Um, and then when you're also there, you'll see we've got order of service, song titles, sermon notes. You could follow along with Jeff this morning. There's um, offering information, so how to give an offering all that stuff is at votrweekly.org. So make sure you go there um, and participate in everything it has available. Um, well, as you guys know, we've been in a series called Citizens of Heaven. We've been studying the book of Philippians together, and we have our last message this week. So here's Jeff. Thank you, Corey. <clears throat> well, as you said, my name is Jeff. I'm the lead pastor here at the Vineyard, and... If we've never met before, I would sure love to change that. My wife and I, Natalie, we almost always try to hang out in the lobby before and after service, and we'd love to connect with you, meet you, help you feel a sense of belonging, and get to know some folks here at the Vineyard. And so come and find us and introduce yourself. We would love to get connected. Well, today's passage in Philippians, as we wrap up this series together, it's, it's a passage filled with hope. A passage that really summarizes what we've been talking about the last few weeks together, really the entire month of February, but it does start with a really interesting phrase, a phrase that Paul uses to talk to us and invite us to live a life that is worth repeating, live a life that someone looks at and says, I want to live my life like that person is 
or that person does. It's all about mimicking or modeling your faith to another. And I will say, just a, a quick aside, if you don't have someone in your life that you look up to in terms of spiritual maturity, someone that you want to see more of their life in your journey with Christ, then you need to find that person. Do whatever it takes to find that person. Shamelessly pursue them. Email them. Text them. Find them. Talk to them encounter them, interrupt conversations to make that relationship happen because it will change your life if you're connected to someone whose faith you want to repeat in your own heart. But at the same time, it's a humbling and sometimes scary realization that your life, your personal life will be mimicked, your life will be repeated by those who are closest to you. Your life is contagious one way or another. You might not even know it, but it is. Now, as a parent, we know this very well. I have three children, and I'm beginning to see my life repeated in them for better or worse. There are good stories. There are bad stories. We should start with a good one. The first time I heard my son begin to share his faith with another he was using phrases and he was using words that he's heard me say before. And when I saw him repeating the same kind of presentation, I thought to myself in prayer, God, this is, this is actually working. Like my life is being repeated in another. The faith is being passed down from generation to generation. God, would you guard this heart and would you protect it? That was one of the more positive things that I had seen and experienced with my children but there are bad ones too. The first time I heard one of my kids snap at either their brother or sister with the phrase, and I quote now, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> with that same like inflection and like shred of shame attached to it, right? I stepped back and I thought to myself, is that what I sound like? Oh my God, that is what I sound like. That is what I say, Lord, help me. Help me so that there are other phrases that my children remember growing up because that one, not so great, right? But we're at the vineyard, right? We love the both and reality. It's not either or, it's not good or bad, it's both and. There are both and stories in our family as well. One of the great ones that I could share with you, it happened last summer. My girls were both playing soccer and soccer is kind of a new sport for me, so I've been learning a lot. The growth curve has been steep. But I have one daughter who, who plays really solid. She loves the game, but she, uh, she really doesn't like to get in trouble. And so she was avoiding playing aggressively at all. She was a great teammate, but she wouldn't like sprint to the ball and kind of aggressively position her body in a way to play defense and, and really help her team out. And so one night at dinner, I had this great idea and, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to address this with her kind of father to daughter. And so I told her this story. I don't know if this is good or bad. You decide. But this is a window into the Faust house nonetheless, okay? So I told her, I said, honey, I think if you play a little more aggressively, things will go well for you. And she goes, well, I don't want to get the whistle blown on me. I want to get a yellow card, which is what happens if you, like, commit a foul in soccer. And I said, here's, here's the deal, honey. I'll make a deal with you. If you get a yellow card... Daddy will take you out for ice cream. <laughs> That's the reality. That's how we roll, okay? That is how we do it. If you get a yellow card, I'll take you out for ice cream. Now listen, I'm not like vying for a red card. I don't want her to injure anybody out there, but I just, I wanted to encourage her, like get after it. Like it's okay, one yellow card's fine. You just don't want two of those things. So, so just play a little more aggressively. And, and it worked. The next game, she came out fired up. She was sprinting to the ball. She was using her body and a little bit of elbow, but just a little bit to kind of protect the ball and help her team out. And I'm telling you, it was a proud dad moment. This was a good moment. But that night at dinner, back at that conversation, what I failed to realize is that I have more than one child. <laughs> and don't you know, parents, that not everybody hears the conversation the same way. And even if they did all hear it the same way, they only remember the parts that they really want to remember. And so I had one daughter who heard, it's okay if I get a yellow card, I want to play aggressive, and daddy said it's okay. But I had another daughter that heard that exact same conversation, and the only thing she heard was, ice cream, 
ice cream. I love ice cream. And so the next game she went out, she had ice cream on the mind. She didn't care what it took to get ice cream. She ran up behind one of the girls that had the ball and with two hands pushed her to the ground, (laughs) stole the ball, ran the other way and scored a goal. Now, in this moment, I have a serious dilemma because publicly I have to display like that I'm appalled. Like, how could this be? But internally, I'm kind of proud that it just happened, right? I mean, just a little bit. And the thing is like, we're in this lineup and all the parents, they know I'm a pastor. So they're like looking at me like, is this, is this what you teach at home? Like, is this how pastor kids come out? Like what on earth is happening? And you know, we just kind of shrug our shoulders and laugh a little bit. But again, we're keeping score. It's one nothing. So like, you're welcome for the dinner conversation. This is a both and reality that you and what you say and how you live, it will be replicated for better or for worse, the good and the bad. The way you live your life, there are deposits in the world around you that, you're happening, that are happening all the time. You're not even aware of all the ways you're planting seeds. You're not even aware which phrases are going to be remembered or which ones are going to be interpreted differently. But this is a reality. Even without trying, our lives are being repeated. And I think most of us are aware of this from time to time. But my life, as an example, sometimes we just forget about it completely as well. And our scripture for today, it's filled with hope, like I said earlier. But it's also filled with this humbling reminder that our life with God, it's not going to be perfect Our life with God won't be perfect. We're still in need of a savior today. But if we live for heaven on earth, if we live as citizens of heaven in this lifetime, then our lives, both yours and mine, our lives will be worth replicating in the the world around us. And that's this bold invitation that Paul has for us this morning. Let's read in Philippians 3, verses 17 to 21. Paul begins by saying, dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I've been, I've told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we, we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. He will take our weak, mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. And in this short paragraph, it's a beautiful passage, but you hear that phrase that we've kind of planned this entire series on. You hear that phrase again, citizens of heaven. It's a beautiful idea, and if you're new to the faith or you're new to the vineyard, not quite sure what to make of Jesus, I do want to point out to you this morning that the Bible teaches us that once you become a follower of Christ, you also become a citizen of heaven. And maybe you're here in this room for the very first time, or you're tuning in with us online and you're not following Christ. You've never made a personal decision to commit your life to Christ. And I want you to know on the front end that by the end of our time together this morning, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. We always, in every service, create an opportunity for you to commit your life to Christ for the very first time. And we'll make space for that to happen in a little while. But first, let's zero back in on the passage, because if you look at verse 17, it starts in this really powerful way. Paul writes, dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. This is a little bit about what I was talking about earlier, that our lives, for better or for worse, whether we know it or not, in good moments and in bad, our lives are models to the world around us. If you have children, they're watching and listening. If you have neighbors, they're watching. If you have coworkers, they're watching. If you have friends, if you're on social media, the world is watching and they're watching how the Christians are living. And and the idea behind this is that they're, they're looking to see what kind of testimony you have. And of course, this book from cover to cover, it teaches us that your life is part of your testimony. Your life is part of your testimony. 
the good, the bad, the ugly, but primarily the redeeming nature of Jesus moving in and through you. Your life, though, is part of your testimony. And now the humbling and sobering question for all of us, how much of your life is worth repeating? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of what Paul is saying here, right? This is the, the weight of this word. How much of your life is worth replicating? And this was a letter written to the church of Philippi almost 2,000 years ago. And because God's word is alive and active, it means that it's the letter written to us this morning. Asking us, even compelling us, to realize that your life and mine, our Christian lives together, they're called to be lives that are worth replicating. Now, most of the time when I sit with Christians and I, and I bring up this passage and I, I ask them about what part of their faith journey or what part of their heart or what part of their life is worth repeating, I get a thousand answers on things that they don't want repeated. The shame and the guilt kind of works its way in there, right? And it's a non-answer. It's a non-answer. The question is, well, how much of it is worth repeating? I bet deep down, each and every one of us, whether it's a mustard size amount or whether it's a mountain amount, we have something in our life with Christ that's worth repeating. Each and every one of us. I mean, Paul had stuff to work on. The earliest followers of Christ had stuff to work on. Yet they wanted to put their life on display. They wanted to live as shining bright lights in the world around them. Of course, we all have things to work on, but just imagine with me for a moment that Jesus was just as loving to you personally as he says he is. I mean, what would it look like? What would it look like if you were as patient with yourself as God is with you? What would it look like if he was as forgiving? What, what would it look like if you experienced that forgiveness in the same way that he talks about it in Scripture? What would it look like for you to be as kind to yourself as Scripture says God is kind to us. Once you wade through some of that love and kindness and forgiveness and it washes over you, then ask, that, ask yourself that question again. How much of my life and what parts of my life is worth repeating? Because I know deep down, each and every one of us, we have something. See, we're called to live a life that is so filled with the grace of God that eventually people start watching and people start looking and they say, I don't know what that person has, but I want it. I need it. The transformation they've experienced, I need in my life. This is us living a life filled with his testimony in and through us. Your life is part of your testimony. And of course, there's tension. Of course, there's tension. Because we're not perfect. Far from it. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We're a church full of imperfect people. And Paul knows this too. In fact, if you just continue reading this passage in verse 18 and 19, he kind of turns the heat up a little bit because it's not all sunshines and roses when we follow Jesus. There are parts of our heart that have to continually be transformed. And Paul revisits this. Look at verse 18 and 19. He says, For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are enemies of the cross of Christ. They're headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. Now, I don't think any of us woke up this morning with that phrase on our mind. Like, it's, I've never met anybody who actually wakes up and they're like, you know what, today, today is the day I'm going to become an enemy of the cross. Like, that's my goal. That's what I'm setting my heart towards, to become an enemy. We just don't think that. Even the most ardent atheists, the most outspoken atheists, they don't think to themselves, I'm going to become an enemy of the cross. If they do, it kind of proves the existence and the power of the cross. So they avoid that, right? Like they're not going to go, nobody wakes up that way, though we don't think I'm going to be an enemy of the cross, yet still Paul says with tears in his eyes, and you can almost feel the emotion as you read the words, he says, it is true. There are some that have shown themselves to be enemies of the cross. In verse 19, Paul said there's three ways that this plays out. First, it's when your God is your appetite. He says it right there in verse 19. Whatever your body craves, whatever your mind wants, whatever you're driven to consume, you consume. Whatever makes you happy in this temporary moment and in this existence, we seek gratification, instant gratification from the pleasures of this world with no thought of their potential consequences. When your God is your appetite. Second, he says, when you brag about shameful things. 
Not just doing shameful things, but now bragging about shameful things. No matter how much it hurts, no matter how much pain it may create or the ripple effect that comes about those actions. And Paul wraps it up by saying this lifestyle just simply doesn't have eternity in mind. It only has today in mind. Eternity with God isn't the driving force for citizens of heaven. Or excuse me, eternity with God isn't the driving force for people who are only thinking about today. And Paul says this is one of the markers, right? And, I, and it, it bothers me. As I was reading this scripture, it was bothering me in a, in a holy kind of way. It was, it was bothering me that I have like an unnatural amount of credibility when it comes to talking about this text. Because I've lived that life for 19 years. When, God, when my God was my appetite. When my glory was my shame and when I was only fixated on what made me happy today. I lived that life for far too long. Most of my vocabulary was filled with words that would describe how crazy the night was before or what I anticipated to do in the coming nights. I was living for temporary relief of incredible pain that was in me. And on the surface, it looked great. On the surface, it looked wild. And in the temporary moments, there was just enough pleasure for me to forget about the pain. But deep down, I was still a mess. Thank you, Jesus, for his salvation. Thank you, God, for forgiveness and being adopted into his family and being set on a path that are marked by his purposes, not just my temporary moments of pleasure. And if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never accepted the free gift of salvation and the forgiveness of sins, then you are in the right church. Because like me, if you call upon his name today, you can start a transforming relationship that will change the rest of your life. He transformed me, and I know he can transform you. Don't Place your hope in the temporary pleasures of the day because you are destined for so much more. You were created for eternity. You were created for eternity with God. Don't replace your eternal destiny with the fleeting pleasures and appetites of today. And that's not to say that that it's somehow wrong to enjoy life today. Of course it's not. There's nothing wrong with feasting and celebrating. There's nothing wrong with enjoying uh, the the life that God has given to you. We're not after becoming a church filled with Gnostics, right? We're like everything in the physical world is bad. The early church rejected that and renounced it as heresy. And we're not going to go that route either. There are good things to enjoy this side of eternity. But a major threat to your spiritual maturity is focusing solely on on the pleasure of today. Instead, Paul is reminding us, much like he did in other passages, to fix your eyes on Jesus, to place your life on an eternal timeline, not just a temporary timeline, because it is impossible to live a life of eternal significance if you're only focused on today. It's impossible to live a life of eternal consequence if you're only focused on today. Today. Instead, Paul reminds us that you are a citizen of heaven. You are a citizen of heaven. Live a life worth replicating by embracing this new identity. Look at verse 20 once more. Paul says, We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. As a follower of Christ, you are now a dual citizen. You live in this world, but you belong to heaven. And because of that, it means that we're called to live differently. We live as bright lights shining in the world around us. It means we don't place our trust in diplomas or retirement accounts, but we are willing to forsake it all for the infinite value of knowing Christ. And it means that we live here, but we belong to God, and we yearn to be with him, eagerly waiting for his return. I mean, think for a moment and just try to imagine the perfection of heaven. Just try for a moment to to conjure up your best thoughts of heaven and your best thoughts of eternity. And then realize that you are an imperfect being. And so even your perfect imaginations will be tainted by your imperfections. 
Are you tracking with me? I mean, even our best imaginations of the day to come will fall utterly short of their reality. It will be so much better than what we can ask for or imagine. And it's because of this hope that in verse 20 becomes so important for us to adopt as a mindset when he says, we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Eagerly waiting for him to return. That phrase in the original language means an intense waiting, a waiting with great expectation and a yearning. And then it's interesting because it says, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for our Savior's return. We're waiting for our Savior's return. See, Jesus came the first time, born as a baby, lived a perfect life so that he could be the perfect sacrifice, was crucified on the cross so that your sins could be forgiven, but was raised back from the dead so that you could experience that resurrection power. But the scriptures teach us that he's coming back again. And Paul says to wait for him with eager expectation, to wait for our Savior to return. Now, if you've read any part of the New Testament, then you would know that Paul could have used a variety of different words to describe Jesus as the returning Savior. He could have used healer. Wait for him as our returning healer. That would have been good. It would have been biblically accurate. Wait for him to return as our Lord or the king of all kings. It says that exact phrase in other passages. So that's good. That's good theology. But here in this moment, Paul says, wait for him to return as our savior, as our savior. And I love it so much because if you've given your life to Christ and you've accepted that free gift of salvation, the Bible says that you have been saved for eternity and thank God for that. But it clearly says we still need a savior. We're still waiting for our Savior to return. Listen, I have been saved and I still need saving. There are parts of my life that still need saving. I've been rescued and I still need a rescuer. Right? I've been forgiven and I still need to be forgiven more. I still need more freedom and transformation and more saving. And until the day he returns, I want to be found waiting with eager expectation. As a citizen of heaven and as a follower of Christ, the scriptures speak to us and Paul speaks to us with tears in his eyes. He says, don't just live for today. Don't just live for these temporary pleasures, but eagerly wait for our Savior's return. With eager expectation, wait for him. What does this look like? What can this look like? Now, I realize that some of you are anxious right now because I just stepped off the stage, but I'm going back on stage. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often, so it's very strange. I realize that. But what I want you to do is I want you to al allow this rope to symbolize your life. Allow this rope to symbolize your life. And I realize that for many of us, it is challenging. It is difficult to imagine the reality that you will live forever, that you will live for eternity. But allow this rope to kind of represent your life because the reality is our life, it will just keep coming and coming and coming and going and going and going. The life will just continue on forever. That's what eternity looks like. This is the extent of your lifetime. And if this rope represents your life, then what that means is that this little loop that I'm holding right here, this little loop right here, it represents your existence on earth. And everything else is eternity with God. Realize that. We are here but for a moment, a blink of an eye. And it's represented by this tiny little spot here on this rope. Everything else is life with God for eternity. The scriptures are teaching us this morning that as citizens of heaven and as followers of Christ, what happens for many of us is we're hyper-focused on one little part of our existence. We hyper-focus on our life today, our life this side of eternity. But why? We have so much more existence to have with Christ forever. Why focus on this little moment, this one little loop? This is why Matt said uh, just a couple of weeks ago, do all things without complaining and grumbling. Why are we going to have one little complaining and grumbling? One little thing doesn't go our way, and somehow now it's going to affect this whole loop, and it's going to affect all of eternity? Come on. Paul says, do it all without complaining and grumbling. This is part of the reason why. Because there's so much more to our life. There's so much more to our existence. Maybe this is a little too abstract, so I'm just going to give you a little bit more. It's still going to be abstract because it's a symbol, but here we go. Maybe... 
Every inch could represent a meaningful moment in your life or something that's impacted you, whether good or bad, right? And so this little loop right here, this is where I was born. I like to think that that was a good moment for me, right? This little loop, there we go, okay. This little loop, this is when I was born. And this next inch, this is when my sister was born. And we became a family of five. That was a big moment. She was miraculously saved. I'll tell that story another day. And this moment here is when I met my best friend in elementary school that I continue to be friends with all the way through high school. That was a big moment for me. But this little moment right here might be when uh, I picked up drugs for the first time. That's, it. That's impacted me. Or this little inch right here is when I picked up the bottle for the first time. Or this might be the 19 years of addiction that I talked about. This might be when my parents got divorced. But this one right here, this is a, this is a really good inch. This is, this is when I met the Lord when I was 19. And I gave my life to him and everything started to change. And shortly after that, I met Natalie. And shortly after that, we started having kids. And shortly after that, I moved here to pastor this church. That was a great moment. I love pastoring this church. But look at that life. That's like a foot and a half, two feet. That's nothing in comparison to eternity. I, I've got a few more inches in my life, no doubt. They're going to be good and they're going to be hard moments. But look, it just keeps coming and coming and coming. Why fixated? on a foot and a half of my existence? Why focus only on here? I'm not even sure I interpret all of these events accurately. I know I don't. There's so much more of my life to experience with God. And I think all of us need to wrestle with this idea. We all need to wrestle with this concept and with this symbol. Do I want this much of life to determine all of eternity? Or do I want all of eternity to begin influencing this part of my life? That's the key. And we have to have this mindset. Paul is encouraging us with tears in his eyes. Don't live just for today, but live for eternity with God. And I don't know what you're going through, and I don't know if you're in, in an amazing time of your life or if you're in a horrible time of life. I don't know how well life has gone for you or how poorly it might be going for you in this very moment. But I do know this. There is coming a day when all the wrong things will be made right. There is coming a day when all the injustices in the world around you and all the injustices that have happened to you in your personal life will be dealt with. There is coming a day when all the pain will be eliminated, all the tears will be wiped away, and all the death will be swallowed up. The temporary pain that we are experiencing is but a blip on the radar of eternity. It's nothing in comparison to eternity. And I'm not trying to minimize your pain. I'm definitely not trying to dismiss your pain. I'm just trying to put your pain into perspective. I'm trying to put it on the continuum of eternity, knowing that there is coming a day when our Savior will return to make all the wrong things right. Verse 21, as I close. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies, like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. By the power of his resurrection, by the power of his resurrection, our weak mortal bodies will be changed into glorious bodies like his own. And it means the whole picture. It means physically. And thank God it means physically. Physically. Right? Like when you sleep on your right side instead of your left side and you wake up with that crank in your neck, like gone. Forever. <laughs> the joint problems that are beginning for me and some of you are like, oh, just wait. I realize I can just wait. <laughs> but I'm not going to minimize your pain. Don't minimize mine either. Mine's, okay? These mortal physical bodies will be redeemed completely when our Savior returns but it means so much more than just your physical body. It means all of yourself. It means body, soul, and spirit. It means your mind will be transformed perfectly. Perfectly. It means that there'll be no more anxiety. It means there'll be no more stress. It means there'll be no more depression. All of those hurtful moments that built up your rope, they'll all be redeemed. They'll all be transformed. The pain that keeps you from moving forward will be wiped away. It means your spirit will be able to perfectly follow God and perfectly experience his love. Imagine a future where you are not even hit with temptation at all. 
Temptation literally has no existence in your future body. Imagine a future where every worship gathering is filled with the perfect power and presence of God. No distractions. Imagine a future with Christ where you can hear his voice perfectly and nothing gets in the way. There is coming a day when everything else inside of you and everything around you will experience his perfect love perfectly. His perfect love perfectly, not tainted by a thing. But until that day comes, where you place your hope matters. Until that day comes, what you live for matters. And until that day comes, living as a citizen of heaven on earth matters. How can you start living for eternity today, building a life with God that is worth replicating? As we move into our time of reflection, let's pray about those things together and anything else that God might be speaking to you about this morning. Pray with me. God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word that is alive and active. Thank you that you are speaking to us right now. We present our hearts before you. We invite you to move among us, to heal and transform, to awaken our souls to this reality. Help us to live for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're new to the vineyard after every message, we always just sit quietly and take a moment of quiet reflection so that you can try to pay attention to the still small voice that God might be using to speak to you right now. We have noticed that if we just rush off to worship, we can sometimes miss the way that God is speaking to us. So we want to create a time where you can sit quietly and prayerfully reflect on everything that you've just heard. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ, then I would encourage you to pray about that today. Pray about giving your life to Christ and becoming a citizen of heaven so that from this day forward, you can begin to experience all the transforming power that Christ has for you. If you're already a follower of Christ, then ask him to speak to you and ask him to give you exactly what you need this morning. Let's take a few moments to quietly reflect and then I'll be back up to lead us into a time of ministry and response. stand together. In addition to creating that time of quiet reflection, we always want to create an opportunity for us to respond to what God might be doing in our midst. There's a variety of ways that you can respond this morning. Of course, the worship team is present. They'll sing a few more songs, and we would encourage you to join your voices with everyone else in this room and join your voices with the voices of heaven, worshiping as we are citizens of heaven living on this earth, let our chorus rise before the throne. 
If you want to come forward and take communion, remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made on your behalf, we would invite you to do that. If you came prepared to give as an act of worship, you can do that by using the boxes in the back or by giving online at any time. And every Sunday we gather, we always have a prayer team in the back and they would love to pray with you. We gather and we have full expectation that God wants to move on earth as it is in heaven. This is the prayer he called us to pray. Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that every Sunday and we would be honored to be able to pray for you personally. And of course, every Sunday, we always wanna give you an opportunity to respond to the invitation that Jesus has for you for the very first time. To receive the free gift of salvation by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. If you've never made that decision, then in a moment, we're gonna invite you to respond and we're gonna invite you to go public with that because we really believe that there's something unique that happens and the Bible teaches us that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior in our heart, but we also confess him as our Lord before others, that we will be saved. It's being saved for eternity, but it's being saved today and tomorrow and the next day and every day forward. And if you've never made that decision, we're gonna give you an opportunity to do that in just a moment. What I would like to do is I would like to start by praying over the room and inviting God to move. And if you're ready to commit your life to Christ for the very first time, then in that prayer, I'm gonna invite you to repeat a prayer with me and then respond after that prayer to all that God might be doing in your life right now. Pray with me over our time of response. Holy Spirit, would you fall upon us right now? Move among us and move in our hearts. Lord, we want to experience the power of your resurrection. We don't want to just talk about it. We want to experience it. So would you come and fall upon us right now? Give us the boldness to respond in all the ways that you might have us respond this morning. For those of you who need to give your life to Christ for the very first time, then just pray this with me right now. Jesus, I come before you in need of a Savior. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. I accept your free gift of salvation. I receive the forgiveness of sins that you paid for on the cross. I make you Lord of my life. Now help me experience your resurrection power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we move around the room and respond, can we just by show of hands, anybody say that prayer for the very first time this morning, give their life to Christ. Can you raise your hand and let us know? We just want to bless you and pray for you. I see you, man. God bless you. Anyone else? Is there anyone else? I just want to make sure that we we catch everyone is responding to the gospel for the very first time. If you're online and you just gave your life to Christ, then we want to bless you too. We would love to pray for you. And so just let us know in the chat that you're responding to the gospel for the very first time as well. Because we want to surround you in prayer, spiritually caring for you from this day forward. Let's all now collectively respond to what God might be doing in our hearts through worship, through communion, through prayer. In a few songs, I'll be back up to close our service together.
talked about the healing that is coming, the ultimate healing when God's kingdom comes in full and we see Jesus face to face. But we believe that there are these moments that break into our present reality where we get just a little foretaste of that. Like where God's healing power breaks into our reality and makes something right that wasn't before. That healing power is here with us today. So we're about to cry out to God in this song and just and just say, heal me, God. Heal me. And I would just encourage you, if that's you, right where you're at, to use this song as a cry to God our Father, who longs to redeem whatever is broken. Can we do that together? Can we sing heal me together? Raise your voice with us. Make this our hearts cry to him. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you that you never leave us, you never abandon us, you never forsake us. Thank you that there is nothing that we can do that will make you love us more. You love us perfectly right here, right now. Help us to experience that more and more. May our lives be lived in response to that great love. We worship you. We lay our lives down before you again. And we ask you to lead us as we leave this place. To be a testimony and a light to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. A couple things on your way out. We have a men's event. Uh, If you haven't seen Bristow waving an axe around in the lobby, it's pretend. But that's what we're doing. So we would love for you to join us. There's a women's event coming up. 
And next week, we're kicking off an awesome series called Signs and Wonders. I don't think you're going to want to miss that one. And so we would encourage you to come back next Sunday and experience more of God's power together. God bless you and have a great Sunday.